I did not move on after the war. It's with me. Like they say, they can take you out of Vietnam, but they can't take Vietnam out of you. My name is John Sabalos. I served in the U.S. Navy, and I was in the Vietnam conflict from 1964 to 68. My name's Alfred Alciati. I served in Vietnam from November 1st till uh, April of 1972. Ralph Marquez, Specialist for U.S. Army. Entered the Army in 1968. And I got out in uh, the end of 69. I spent two tours in Vietnam, one with the Army and one with the Marine Corps. I turned 21 in Vietnam. And then my second tour, I was 22 and a half years old. I was still a kid. I enlisted, but only after I was a sophomore in high school. And I got in after I heard about the Kennedy assassination. And I wanted to go over there and not to be a hero, but to do my part. I went through all the schools at Morgan Hill, and I graduated from Live Oak in 1967. The war in Vietnam was very, going very strong, and they were drafting a lot of people, and we, they drafted a lot of my classmates. A friend of mine we decided to go into the United States Navy. They had a, a, a two by six. You go two years active and six year reserve. We felt that was a better way to go at that time, and so I got, uh, I signed up for the Navy at that time. I joined when I was 17. Mom had to, mom was still in Texas. So I wrote a letter and, and told her to sign the papers because they wouldn't take me unless I was 18. And mom says, why? He says, the war, Vietnam war is going on, son. They're gonna send you to war. I said, so what, mom? You know, I'm only 17. I'm working out in the fields with a bunch of people coming in from Mexico, working out here. They're much older than I am. I'm the only kid working with all these grown men. I hated it because in Texas, I was in ROTC. I was a first lieutenant in ROTC. I was a young officer. I was vice president of the student council. I played football. I had A's and B's. I was doing good over there. And then they take me out of there to come down here and do that. I was in cultural shock. And I said, I'm not going to do this the rest of my life, Dad. I want to join the military. And then at least in the military, the Vietnam War is going on. At least if they kill me out there, I'll die with honors. Out here, they, they kill me because I'm just an idiot and I have no education anymore. I was drafted. I, actually, I turned 21 on, on my induction day. I took the bus out of Calexico, California, and uh, on the way up to boot camp, two of the inductees uh, pulled out knives and, and they wanted us to contribute to buy beer. We all contributed and then they got off in India and never got back on. Somewhere along the line, I think it was Oregon, we bought a bunch of booze. And uh, when we got to Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, they, they took us out and lined us up. It was, it was dark already. And they said that uh, they were gonna search everybody for booze. So all the uh, booze bottles fell on the ground and they were cracking all over the place. There was uh, whiskey and tequila and everything on the floor. I went to boot camp uh, in San Diego. That was a Navy base, Navy and Marine base was in San Diego. That was in 69. You would go in the barracks and you'd be with all new people. You got like 35 all new men that were from the whole United States, from California to New York to Texas to Michigan. You, you didn't know any of these people and you uh, now were part of a company Boot camp was like uh, after we took our test in Oakland. They flew us out that same day down to San Diego. We got there maybe about 10 o'clock in the evening. They got us up about four. And from there on, it was running. They were trying to teach us what we needed to know. You know, we were running every place or marching to wherever we went. Our first week was hectic. It was a basic training. 
So we just did all the basics, marching, learning how to march, uh, firing uh, the, the M14, getting used to being gassed. They call it CS gas, but it's, they, some people call it tear gas. They uh, put us in a room and made us walk around in circles and sang Mary Had a Little Lamb. And then they, they, there was a pipe in the center and the gas came out. And uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't take the gas, so I grabbed my helmet. My helmet was already on my head. I had it, got, grabbed it with both hands, and I crashed through the door. One of my first days there, it was pretty hot. And it was kind of inter it was funny as I, uh, I, we had to wear long sleeve shirts like this, and uh, I rolled up my sleeves. And one of the drill instructors came over and said, hey, sailor, what are you doing? And I said, man, it's pretty hot here. Uh, I rolled up my sleeves and he says, roll those sleeves right down right now and give me 24 push-ups. And that's what I had to do. And a couple of my other uh, sailors were next to me. They started laughing. And he said, what are you laughing at? Give me 10 right now. So they had to do 10 push-ups. So I learned right away real quick that the first couple of days that, you know, that to take orders and, and uh, to watch what I, we were doing there. I didn't, uh, I didn't really take anything real seriously. So uh, I got in a lot of trouble. One time I had to brush a asphalt sidewalk with a toothbrush and hot water and soap for walking around with my hands in my pocket. All these things were done in order to make, or for you to obey any dumb uh, command that you get. You never um, question a command that you get, you just do it. First job assignment with an, uh, uh, what they call snipe or an engine man. It's a below deck mechanic on ships. And I worked on small cylinder motors, two cycles diesel engine, 671s, Jimmy Diesels, anything that had to do with the motor. They flew me off the ship into Da Nang there. And that was my first tour. And then I was in Da Nang for 13 months. And then the daily life that you lead in Da Nang or in country there, it's a lot. It's hard to explain because you are constantly on your, your alert, you're alert all the time. You don't have no downtime. That's why a lot, a lot of veterans are hypertension right now, no matter what war they're in. I was in the combat areas. I wasn't in it with a bunch of units or anything firing at the enemy that they knew where they were and they weren't firing on me. But that feeling was always there. You knew someone was there. And the places I went to were out of the way. And I seen a uh, corpse. Yes, I saw plenty of those, mostly Americans. <clears throat> when I first got there, flew into Da Nang, and there must have been 12 to 20 of us coming off the plane. And I can't remember who it was, but it was a person dressed in white. He says, you, all of you, come here, we need your help. So we threw our duffel bag down. And we ended up working in a mass unit for about 14 days. And the majority of us, were, what we were doing was not working in the hospital tents, but we are moving bodies in body bags. At first, we didn't know what they were. We were just moving. We knew they were probably body bags, but we were so fresh we didn't know what was going on. So we were moving them back and forth, loading them on trucks, putting them on gurneys, moving them out. We didn't know they were dead at the time. We thought, well, you know, they were going from one place to the other. That's how naive we were, you know. There is no peace of mind. You just learn to accept it and live with it. And I know different 
persons will have different versions of it, but you're constantly on alert when you're doing that. You're glad you don't have to go on patrol. You're glad you don't have to watch this. You're glad you don't have to do that. There was no green zone over there, safe zone like they call now. You were constantly on alert no matter what. I did not see any combat. We were off the coast of Vietnam, about 100 miles to 200 miles from Hanoi. And our job was to, these areas where supply lines are, bridges, Ho Chi Minh Trail. My job on, on the ship was, uh, I was the illustrated draftsman, so I was in charge of the mapping for uh, the pilots to, I would bring them uh, the maps that they needed for their routes. And we would have reconnaissance planes going out, taking pictures and come back in. We look at the pictures and see how our bombing mission would go. And the pilots would take that and then come back. And we had sent another reconnaissance plane out to see how that, uh, uh, how that, that was success or not. And then we keep doing that over and over again. We had flight operations during the day, flight operations during the night. We would spend 30 to 40 days out there off the coast of uh, Vietnam, go back into the Philippines for two or three days, and then go back out again. It was just, you, you were working 12 hours, you get off 12 hours. Um, there's planes landing. Uh, now, I was in operation, so my room, I had my drafting room, was right next to the catapult. And I can hear, when I'm doing my drawings, I can hear the plane getting ready to take off on catapult number one. And it would, uh, you hear the engines going roaring up and all of a sudden <laughs> come through and, and the catapult would stop about another 100 feet past mine. And then the catapult would come back over and be going through that uh, during the day. Then at night, our bunk areas was in the back part of the ship and uh, we can hear the jets coming in and they have the restraining wires going across. They have four restraining wires that catch the tail hooks of the uh, uh, airplanes coming in. So you can hear them coming and you hear the clank of the tail hook hitting the deck and while you're sleeping there and you hear the, the cable going and the jet would start its engine again, drop the tail hook down the, the cable would come across and, and then you just try to go to sleep and then there comes another plane coming in. But that was going on day and night because uh, uh, we, we had a lot of bombing missions to do. And our ship had uh, numerous um, general quarters. And what I mean by general quarters is that there was a MiG, which is a North Vietnam jet that um, it was in the area that could be a threat to us. So we would have general quarters, but we never got shot at, at on the ship. We lost two pilots on our, on, our, on our ship. And one of the pilots was Fred Holmes, and he's from Morgan Hill. And uh, I talked to him one time on there, and uh, we lost him. And he was a lieutenant commander of uh, one of the, our the A6 uh, airplanes, and he got shot down over Vietnam. Everybody was pretty green in that valley, and uh, I felt like they were using us for uh, bait. This is what I've, I, personally, what I felt was that they were, they had us out there so that we could draw the Viet Cong out of the jungle to attack us. And they had these uh, mountaintop couple miles away with the helicopters and a big, a couple of companies of, uh, of soldiers. And once uh, you got them out of the jungle, they would come and we could kill a bunch of them. My first patrol out of, was, was out of Docto. And uh, they took us up into the mountains by helicopter. And uh, later on, we went to a place called um, Bam me to it. And it was a flat land. There we, we got hit almost every day. 
mortar rounds or recoilless rifle. And they were uh, killing somebody almost every day, but only one person. We had snipers come into the edge of the perimeter and just empty out a, a, a magazine of AK-47, which is like uh, 18, 20 rounds. And they would, they would shoot only one or two guys, wound one or kill one. So we would go out and uh, sit in the bushes at, in the daytime and see if we could catch this guy coming in. To, but he'd come from a different side every day. So we never knew where they were coming from. They were waiting on the trails and they were ambushing our patrols. One of those days, my, my squad leader got hit with a mortar round. When I was in my tent and they asked me if I wanted to go see him, I said, I said he was cut in half. So I didn't want to go see him. And because they killed my patrol leader, they made me squad leader. I was a uh, patrol leader for the rest of my term. The guys that I was with, were just fresh off the boat. So I was, uh, didn't know what I was doing and they didn't know what they were doing. Somewhere out there, we ran into, uh, I'm not sure what it was because uh, I had my guys uh, pick up and leave. We all picked up and left because I didn't know how big the, the, the squad that was coming at us was and it was just tall grass, and I didn't want anybody getting shot. We believed that they were coming after us because it sounded like a lot of them. So uh, we ran and uh, finally uh, we lost them. And uh, then on our way back after our, it was four days out, out there, I couldn't find my way back. And uh, just like in the movies, you have a guy who starts crying. He's saying, you're going to get us killed. You're going to get us killed. You don't know where you're going. We're going to go this way. And I said, you're not going to go that way. You're not going to split up the patrol. Well, you're going to get us killed. And so I had to keep them together and after about two days because it was a, a, a flat place. There was no way to tell where the company was at. And so we're walking and it's getting dark and we find these holes where the Viet Cong had been dug in. There were tunnels. And then uh, we saw a helicopter and it landed where the company was at. And we we're about two miles away. But that's how we found our way back, was that helicopter that landed. Sometime during that day, uh, we got a, a call that Alpha Company was under attack and that we needed to go up there and, and help them out. So that, I don't know how far they were, but we packed up immediately. And we started uh, humping. We didn't stop till they got late at night. And when we stopped, it was on a steep hill, so we all had to sleep with our feet on a tree trunk so you wouldn't roll down the hill. We only slept like three or four hours. And then we got up and started going to where Alpha Company was at. The next day, I, uh, I went out and dug a hole what they call a listening post, and it's outside the perimeter. And the, your job there is to be the first contact if there's a Vietnamese are coming. And I, I was sitting in there, and my, the sergeant, I said, uh, come on down here with me, I, I said, because there wasn't enough holes, so some of those guys were fairly new. I said, give, the, give those guys your hole. And so he, he came down there and we were sitting there. 
and uh, things they start attacking us from different sides, but not on not not on the side where I was at. And then uh, all of a sudden, I see this guy coming up up the hill. And he's walking very slowly, but he's walking right at me. So there's no lateral movement. So I couldn't really see him because he was walking straight up. And then when I did see him, he was pretty close. So when he saw me, I saw him. And he jumped behind a tree. And my, uh, my friend that was with me got out of the hole and he, he had his M16, my M16. And I, I threw a grenade at the guy and I, and I saw his body scoot from one side of the tree to the, to the other side of the tree. And I said, I, I think I got him. I said, I'm pretty sure I got him with a, with a grenade. But he got out of the hole and he went over there and he started shooting at him from the other side of the tree. He was only like four feet away. And then when he started to come back, somebody shot him uh, right above the heart. So he f I caught him falling into the hole. And then I uh, panicked. Because I'm out there and uh, I'm surrounded by North Vietnamese. And I, uh, I said, I, I, gotta, I gotta come in. And, they, and uh, those guys are telling me, you gotta come in. And I said, well, Okay, I'm going to come in. And I said, you got to bring Johnson with you. I said, how in the hell am I going to run up the hill with the weight of, a, of somebody that's dead? But I, I called him up, told him uh, everybody start shooting, and I was going to run up the hill. So I put him on my back, and I run up the hill, and I didn't get hit. But uh, my friend was dead. On the way back, um, my lieutenant got hit. And he got hit, and he fell on the ground. And he got hit in the back of the head by a mortar. And he was flopping around the ground. He, he, was, he wasn't making any sense when he was talking, and he, he was trying to get up. So I put my foot in the back of his, on his back and I uh, took a pressure bandage and I wrapped his neck up. And then uh, I, I think he got airlifted out. A battle lasted three days. I think on the second or third day, I heard screams, but the screams were in Spanish. So I knew these guys were hit. They, they dropped a mortar around in their, in, their, in their hole. Anyway, by uh, the, um, in order to evacuate, we, they had to cut down all the trees that were in the way for the helicopters to land. So they had these helicopters come in and uh, the, um, what they call the demolition guys repelled off the helicopters by rope. They dropped down maybe 40, 40 feet or something like that by rope. And then they, uh, they started to put C4 in all the big trees and they wrapped it out with detonator cord. They had these spools of cord about the size of a regular cord, but they were white, it was white and they put C4 explosives all around the tree and then they wrapped them with a detonator cord and they did it all the way around the perimeter which was maybe 50 yards across and uh, they had fired some mortar rounds at us and the mortar rounds some of them didn't explode they were small mortar rounds they were like uh, 10 millimeter or something they were, the fins were sticking out of the ground. So we took all the dirt out and we took a white sheet and wrapped little flags around all the, all the little 
fins on the uh, mortar rounds. And the detonator cord went right over the fins. And then one of those other guys came by, walking by and he stepped on the mortar round and the whole thing exploded with everybody standing around. I think I flew about 20 feet. Me and my friend Bosch uh, flew 20 feet and somebody else, I don't remember who it was. But I landed uh, and I was crawling. And then I said, uh, well, I can't, I can't crawl out because that's, I'm going out, toward, out of the perimeter. So I turned around and said, I'm going the wrong way. So I went back up and it was just, everybody was wounded and everything was, uh, was in disarray. And uh, the, uh, the guy with the, the, with the detonator cord, he had a big spool, he had a stick in it and he had a spool and he was just spinning it around the trees, wrapping the trees with detonator cord. He completely disappeared. The guy who stepped on the mortar rounds, the mortar rounds went off and it blew all his clothes off and he was just black. He was standing there with a, naked with a black. And after it was all done, I think there was 26 of us out of, I think out of a hundred. And then we finally got uh, somebody to come and replace us. And they moved us back to a safer position. I was in Saigon and uh, I got there in January the 15th and then Tet Offensive hit us hard. Tet was one of the worst wars we had in Vietnam and I was right there in the middle of it. First day we got hit, we lost 200 people in just one day. We were getting hit left and right. A lot of rockets were coming down, which I still hear them every, every now and then. Um, they were terrible. The 122 millimeter rockets were very big and very destroyable. If you've seen dirt clots, when you dig up a hole, the dirt clots are about this big. Well, the dirt clots that were coming out when the rocket hit was bigger than my body. If you get hit one, one of, with one of those dirt clots, you were dead. And they scared me every time. I remember one 19-year-old boy that got in Vietnam and he was scared. When he first got there, it was a replacement for one I had just lost two days before. And I told him, you're too quiet, you don't talk too much. What's wrong? I know you got a problem because I was his leader, I was a sergeant. He says, he says, I just got married before I got here. I'm 19 years old and I, and I miss my marriage, and my honeymoon and my wife, and I don't want to die here. I looked at him, I said, I know how you, I know how you feel, young man, but you're going to be all right. Tonight when we go on patrols is the first time you're going to go on patrol because we go on patrol every night looking for the enemy. I said, I'll make sure you're going to be all right. I'm going to put you in the back. There's only five of us. So I said, you'll be the last man on patrol. That way, uh, the, way the first ones usually get hit in the front. Well, guess what? That night, he was the first one that got hit, and he died. That first patrol he went in, he died. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. I saw that young man crying his ass off after I tried to help him and put him in the back. And I felt like I, I got him killed because I put him in the back. I felt it was my fault. I didn't save him. He got killed. He never went back home. Sometimes we wouldn't get in the mail because the helicopter wouldn't come in because they were afraid to be gunned down. So they call us on the radio and say, hey, we will not be able to take your ammunition or, or, or sea rations for a while because we can't come in. So eat whatever you can find in the land and survive with whatever you can find. And I did. I ate some stuff that I th thought I knew we were gonna eat. I remember eating worms sometimes. Uh, slugs, 
long slugs like that. I took off a bark behind the bark of a tree because I was so damn hungry. By the way, I lost 65 pounds in four months on a banana island where the tunnels were. We were looking for the enemy that was hiding in the tunnels. So what my unit did was bring in Huey helicopters full of five gallon gas of tanks uh, of gas, five gallon tanks of gas in the helicopter and they were pouring it down the entry of the, of the tunnels. They put a lot of gas in there and then they put a flame to it so that the enemy that was hiding in there would run out the other, opposite end. And my captain put me at the other end and he told me to, he was, he was bringing in a flamethrower and to burn them as they were coming out. And I told him, I said, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm a Christian. I have a machine gun. I can just kill them as they come out, shoot them. Same thing, you're going to kill them anyway. He says, no, I want, I want you to torture them. I want you to burn them. I said, sir, I don't want to do that. He says, well, if you don't, he says, you're going to, you're going to go to prison because you're, you're disobeying an order in an, in an enemy zone. I said, well, that's what you want me to do. Then I don't want to go to jail. I said, I'll burn them. And as, as I was burning them, you know, these, these are human beings. Even though they're enemies, they're human beings. They were yelling like babies from the fire. And I kept watching them and burning them. I burned 11 of them. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. I know I'm tough. I'm, I'm a Marine. And I learned how to kill. I was a killer. And I did a lot of killing. I even killed men with my hands. I broke their neck. And I can still hear the bones in my dreams sometimes when the, when the bones are breaking as I twisted their neck. I would never kill a cricket, and I will not step on a cricket. And I told that to my psychiatrist, he asked me, why? I said, because I used to collect crickets out there when I was in the jungle, as much as I could. And what I do with the crickets, I take my sewing kit and I get a little piece of thread and tie a little piece of thread to the cricket's leg. And you know how they chirp all night? And they're chirping and chirping, you can hear them, but if you walk by them, they, they quiet down. Well, I learned that in the war and I learned to use them. So what I would do, I'd take a little cricket and I'd tie the little cricket next to the mine, to the legs of the mine, and the cricket, would, the little thread would be about that long and the cricket would be right there next to the mine. I put four crickets, two on this side and two on that side, and I'd lay out two mines per night next to my foxhole. And then I would run the wire all the way back to my, to my hole where I was in it and then I got that push button that I could press it and it would blow whoever's out there. And I would just listen to the crickets in, at nighttime. They would be chirping and chirping. And all of a sudden the, the crickets would shut up and they wouldn't make no more noise. I said, somebody's out there. So I get my night scope. I go up there and look through it at nighttime. And sure enough, when I look through the scope, I can see some bodies coming down. So I said, okay, get a little closer, you bastard. As soon as they came closer, I just press a button and blow them away. Thanks to those crickets. That's why I respect the crickets. I told that to my doctor, he says, that's amazing. I said, that's something that I had to do to survive, sir. Even when I was eating, sometimes I, I would have my machine gun right here and I would eat with my left hand. All the time I was over there, I never ate with two hands. No, because I wanted to be one step ahead of the enemy. I remember the last two I killed, they, they were, I was sent by a river I had just crossed the river and I ran into little watermelon patch. Watermelons don't go big over there. They're about that size, they're little. But I was so hungry that I took one of them and I hit it on, uh, over a rock and it split in half. And I couldn't wait because I was so hungry. I was sucking up the watermelon, the half of the watermelon that I had split open. I was sucking it up like this and sucking it as much as I could because I was so hungry. But my, my machine gun was down here. My uncle had been in Korea. I lost him this year my dad's only brother. And before I went over there, because he, he was in the Korean War, he gave me a medal he wore over there in Korea all the time. He says, wear this, son, when you go out there and don't ever take it off. I wore it during the war and it brought me back home. So I believed my uncle, so I kept it and I was wearing it. It's a religious chain he had, but it was made out of cloth, not out of metal. And he had the religious figure hanging in here. So I saw two, two people coming down from a distance, and they were all dressed in black. I said, this has got to be Viet Cong. 
So I was squatting down like this, my legs crossed, sucking up the watermelon with my machine gun out here. And I said, oh, I'm not gonna shoot them from here because they know they're not bothering me. I'm gonna wait till they get closer. So they kept getting closer and closer. When they got close to me enough, they, they asked me if I was a Buddha, you know, like a priest or something from over there. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I'm not a Buddha. He says, you got, you're wearing this thing here. They were talking to me in Vietnamese. And I learned Vietnamese, I speak Vietnamese, and I understood what they were talking about because I attended Vietnamese language school. So they were asking me in Vietnamese if I was a priest. And I, I told them, I said, yes, I'm a priest. And I lied. I wanted to distract them because I knew when they asked me, their eyes were going to look down at this thing when I grabbed it. And they had their guns loaded and they had them in their hands. And I knew they were Viet Cong right away. So I said, yes, I'm a priest. I couldn't get up because I was squatting down, so they had the advantage of getting to me because I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't have time to get up. But I had my hand where I learned to keep it all the time. And I said, yes, I'm a priest. I, I'll show you my, my priest thing. And when their eyes, I was looking at their faces, and when I saw their eyes looking at this here, that I was going like this, I just went like this, and I killed both of them. So I just threw their ass into the river. And that's how I survived. And then I got hurt my second tour. I crashed in a Huey and I busted both of my legs and my right shoulder. I was put in a, in a hospital boat that was out in the China Sea. It was called the USS Sanctuary. And during the time I was on that boat, when I was getting better, I was, I was using crutches. And my doctor would tell me to go walk on the top deck of the boat because it was flat up there and there was nothing else out there. The only thing I could do to keep my mind is to go read all the names of the dead bodies that were on there. They were taking bodies to Guam and they had them on body bags and there were four stacked bodies like that and three this way. It was three bodies this way and four stack highs and they were all around the top deck of the boat. They were being taken to Guam so they can transfer them to the U.S. from there. I would say, oh, you're only... I remember talking to myself and I'll never forget that either. I said, oh, you, you're only 19 years old. You were young, you were younger than me. Texas, God bless you, I would say. God bless to everyone I read. And that's what I would do. The next day I didn't finish reading all the tags, so I would go back again when I go walking and read the rest of the bodies that were there. And it, it was something that uh, I'll never forget, never. You don't win them. You don't win awards. You're, you earn them, they're handed to you. Yes, I have earned them. Uh, one that I'm particularly proud of is the presidential unit citation they gave our unit. And yes, I served the Vietnam Medal. I've got two campaign medals on there, two bronze stars. And the rest, because I got out, and the rest of the medals that I've earned were in the National Guard, city riots and stuff like that down in Los Angeles area, you know, so. But I'm more proud of that presidential unit citation than anything else, you know. I didn't get no Purple Hearts, which I'm glad. <laughs> our medals that we got on our, our ship uh, for, for our service out there was the Civil Defense Medal and our uh, Vietnam Service Medal. And we also got Materials uh, Service Medal from Vietnam. And we also got the Presidential Unit Citation, uh, which is one of the highest medals that we get. And that's from the President of the United States who recognizes that our ship did an outstanding job there on the, on the line when we were off the coast of Vietnam. Well, I was, at, I was at Fort Ord and I was uh, doing parades and uh, I was doing the music for parades just from up on the, up on the, like a, just like a stadium. And then one day they told me that I had gotten a bronze star and I could go pick it up at this place where they had to, it was like a, uh, a dispatch place. And then I went over there and picked it up. And that was it. Just a regular Vietnam veteran. I didn't want any medals. And I told them, they offered me one time when, when we had 
several locations that were, I was involved deeply in it. I said, I don't want any medals. I just want my life. I just want to get back to my family. Medals don't mean nothing to me. I believe I was 19 and 20 when I went home. On the four tours that I were there, I believe I came home one time, and that was on emergency leave through American Red Cross. My mother had a stroke. I would go to sleep, but I wouldn't be completely asleep. I was always on alert. I enjoyed being home. I enjoyed uh, the family and everything. And they asked me, how is it over there? And I go, well, it's hard to explain. I said, it's great. I mean, we're having a good time. But I was masking the real feelings I had because I did not think that they would understand what I was talking about. And I did, did not want to seem like I was strange to all the people that I grew up with. But later on, I found out it was true. I was acting strange to them. But to me, it was normal. Plainly, I wasn't. As I know, everybody else was not warmly received. I got out of the service at TI, Treasure Island. They bust me from there to Gilroy on a Greyhound bus. I got off the bus in, in Gilroy here, like about nine or 10 in the evening. Couldn't get a ride, didn't have phones or cell phones back there then. So I just said, well, maybe somebody will give me a ride home. Cause I knew everybody was still cruising up and down. I, see, I said, I'll catch one of my friends from school and stuff like that. I walked from maybe two, two and a half miles to where I lived. Most of that by myself with my duffel bag over and over my shoulder. And I saw, which I thought were friends and school buddies. I'd see them, I waved them, they'd just look at me and keep driving. I was in my uniform. And then I wasn't no more than a block, maybe two blocks from home when a school buddy that I <clears throat> grew up with saw me because somebody called him and told him I was home and I was walking home. So he went out and picked me up about two blocks from the house. And he welcomed me and I was glad, but what really stunned me is that my, which I thought was friends, guys I played football with, guys I used to drink beer with, even the girls wouldn't talk to me, get near me. And that lasted for a long time also, because I was in that unfortunately conflict and they would call us baby killers, this and that and everything. And we said, what do you mean? We're out here doing a job. A lot of, a lot of people didn't understand. Why are you over there? To me, we had stopped communist communism from spreading and that country had asked us to help being in the service you're just out there helping out you're doing you're trying to do your job when i came home um, yes it was it was uh, a lot of people were against the war and a lot of people wanted to be quiet about the war and so when when i came back it was a whole feeling of let's don't talk about it. And a lot of the, our, our sailors and uh, veterans uh, never talked about the war when they came back. When I got back home is that, you know, everybody on the ship is from different states and everything. So I really couldn't stay in contact with my friends that were on there because uh, you have to be close friends when you're on the ship because uh, you're all working together and uh, so when, when we got out, everybody went their separate ways. I had bought a new Dodge Charger through the PX in uh, Vietnam. They took uh, money out of my, my pay and it went to the, to the Dodge dealership in Oregon. So when I came back, I had a brand new Dodge Charger, 69 Dodge Charger. And I flew from Washington State to 
to uh, for, uh, or Portland, Oregon. And so I get in the new car. I hadn't driven a car in over a, maybe two years. And it was just strange driving through Oregon in the dark with no rifle. Kept looking out the windows. And I drove all the way to San Jose from Portland, Oregon. And then from there, I drove back to my hometown in Imperial Valley. And after that, I just uh, stayed drunk. I was, I was in solitary confinement in my home when I came back from Vietnam. For two years, I wouldn't go nowhere. My wife can witness that. I wouldn't go to the store, I wouldn't go shopping, I wouldn't go nowhere, I wouldn't go fishing. I don't, I don't, I don't go hunting anymore. I don't like to kill no more. I don't even like to kill the animals. When I came back from Vietnam, my second tour, we landed in Oakland. And our captain told us before we got the airplane, he says, there's a lot of protesters out there. Don't start any fight. He says, you're not in war anymore. We don't have any guns anymore with us. Don't, you're gonna go to jail if you try to hit one of those guys. Well, they had a big, like a fence type of thing, but they were standing on chairs and stuff. I got off and I was walking out of the airplane and I got hit with tomatoes in my uniform. I got hit with a cabbage. And they were throwing vegetables, throwing crap at us, calling us baby killers and all kinds of names. Why, I do not know. I have no idea why. I really, I, up till now, all of what I've heard from other people, why they were doing the protesting. They didn't, they didn't like the Vietnam War. But why take it out on us? I went over there fighting for America, not once, but twice. And for them to hit me with tomatoes and the cabbage when I got back from Vietnam, I still don't understand it. Even to this day, I still have dreams waking up yelling. My wife even tells me, I said, I don't remember a dream. You know, I'm frailing my arms, even though I'm going to therapy, I go group sessions, PTSD groups, PTSD groups. Uh, I haven't moved on. <clears throat> when I get up <clears throat> at night to go to the restroom, if I can't sleep, I'll get up and walk around the house. I check the door locks, I check, look out the back, look out the sides, just constant alert. I, I look out in the front and see who's walking by. And if I do see someone walking, I just keep an eye on them. Well, what are they doing at this time of night? That type of thing, you know. I'm always, I'm still alert. I don't, I, I don't want to be, but it's, it's constantly with you. And I know a lot of guys, veterans, men and women are like that right now. They try to mask it, they cover it. I try to do it too, but I catch myself doing it just about every night. The war uh, taught me a lot of things. It taught me a lot of how to respect people and how to respect veterans, because the veterans do a lot of work out there on, on the, when they're out in the combat zone. We were out there, we were doing 12 hours on, 12 hours off, you know, so you, it's, it, you come home and, and you respect what veterans have done in, in, the, in a war zone. Still, uh, loud noises always uh, shake me. Or it, it, it doesn't even have to sound like a gunfire. It's just loud noises, abrupt loud noises, like horns or, you know, those ones that they use in football games? If you don't know they're coming, you, it, uh, it uh, messes with my, my, my hearing. It kind of makes me dizzy. I don't have the nightmares I used to have, but sometimes they do. And I, I've learned to wake myself up. Instead of when my, my, my nightmares get to where I can't stand it anymore, I wake myself up. I still have nightmares. Not as bad as I used to, but because of the nightmares, uh, I had to see a psychiatrist. And I saw a psychiatrist for 20 years, once a month. 
My wife knows what to do. She, she shakes me. I, I said, well, what do I do? What do I do? How, how do you know I have a nightmare? He says, you start breathing very hard. And you start, you start kind of like, like you're running. And I told her, I said, I was running. I was running for safety. I was running to go hide behind an object or, or running to get into the helicopter. I was running. He says, well, I can hear you running. So all she does is grabs me and she shakes me. Hey, that's okay, it's okay, you're gonna be all right. Because I have heavy PTSD. One of the symptoms of PTSD is losing memory. And I try hard sometimes in my bedroom to try to think of some of, some of those names of the guys that, was, that were with me. And I just can't remember none of them. I just say, well, wherever you are, God bless you too, if you're still alive. I'll never be myself again as far as uh, what I used to be. Civilian-wise, I came back as I was supposed to be a diesel mechanic. I learned a trade in the service. And at that time, I could not find a job as a diesel mechanic. So I started out in a body shop, repairing automobiles, trucks, RVs, and all that. I stayed in that business for 12 years. Civilian-wise, then I had to get out. Because of my lungs, I was a painter. <clears throat> I was a journeyman painter, but I had pleurisy in my lungs every year. I couldn't get rid of it. I either had to get out of there or accept whatever came after that. So, but I wanted to stay in the industry, so I became an insurance appraiser working on cars, writing estimates for different insurance companies. And at the same time when I got out, I still had that craving for, uh, I couldn't stand still. I had to be doing something. So I joined the uh, local California Army National Guard because my brother-in-law was in it. And I joined the scout platoon. And at that time, I did not know it, but that was like therapy for me. During the course of the years that I was in, I was actually recruiting guys to come into the platoons and being part of the unit. And I think that's what kept me sane and not become an alcoholic and, you know, stuff like that. You know, so it was, it's hard to explain, but to me, if, I, if it happened again, I would do that again. Because these guys came out and it was too calm. We all talked the same language. We, we didn't have to tell each other what to do because we knew. So when I came home, I, uh, I had a job still lined up when uh, I, I worked at United Centrifugal Pumps as a draftsman. So I went and worked there for a year. And that was up in San Jose, California. And I uh, decided that I wanted to work a little closer because of uh, uh, traffic. And the traffic back in 1972, 73 wasn't that bad, I don't think. But in my opinion, back then it was, it was kind of a, a rush hour to get up there. So I uh, came back here to Morgan Hill and I took a job with the city of Morgan Hill and uh, worked as a building inspector, building official for 24 years with the city of Morgan Hill. And then I worked 11 years for the County of Santa Clara um, as a senior inspector for Stanford University. I, and I do a lot of volunteering, and which helps me out a lot. I volunteer for the Morgan Hill Historical Society. I, uh, I do the chain gang for the Live Oak uh, High School for it's been 30 years now. I uh, volunteer for the Gilroy Garlic Festival. I did that for 24 years. I'm currently, right now, I volunteer here at the, the post, at our uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 6309. I, uh, I'm the post commander here. I, uh, I, I've been here since 2014, and uh, it's a two-year position as commander. I also do the color guard. Uh, I volunteer for the color guard here, which we do uh, opening ceremony services. And I also volunteer for the uh, honor guard, which we do services for funerals and stuff. We do the 21 gun salute. We have a ceremony that Eddie Bowers put up in Morgan Hill. And uh, I helped them put that together, helped them get it started with that with, through the city when I was working with the city. And we, uh, 
We got their names put up and every Veterans Day and Memorial Day, we uh, hold a ceremony there uh, at nine o'clock uh, downtown on First Street in uh, Monterey. I got out in uh, the end of 69, somewhere in the end of 69. And I did my last uh, six months in Fort Ord, California, Fort Ord, California. I just didn't want anything to do with the Army, so I, I, uh, I went away all for two months, and then I went back to Fort Ord, and uh, they didn't do anything. They didn't dock my pay or anything. And uh, at Fort Ord, I was showing films and uh, doing uh, artwork for uh, instructions. The new lieutenants that were coming in, I, I had to show a film and they, uh, the guy that was the instructor on me says, uh, all those guys from Vietnam, he goes, just leave them alone. They just want to finish their, their uh, term and get out. So more or less they left me alone. For a living, I worked at cabinet shops and uh, I was a mailman for about three or four years but I thought I might go postal. And so my friends told me I should leave the post office. And uh, my last job was maintenance, where I spent a lot of time by myself. Yes. I do a lot of nudes. I go over to Santa Cruz and paint models and I do a lot of landscapes, and uh, now I'm doing abstract. The camaraderie, some people call it brotherhood, but you learn to see how other people react other than your small time town feelings. We've learned it being the veterans. If we could only get across to the civilian population on what we went through, I would love to go on a talking tour to talk to people, let them know that it was not easy. I wouldn't want to put them in a situation like that. I hope no one ever does. Because when they, when they signed up, the veteran, they signed a blank check, not knowing if they were gonna come back. I hope they walk away with a better understanding of what the military is doing and what the individual that was in the military has gone through and not discard them like, oh, that's another homeless veteran or that's another person that can't make it. His mind is going through 10 different things while yours is going through one. No one wants war, but you have to be prepared. You have to have a fighting force ready to go in. But they've got to have that mindset, you know, I said, okay, we don't want war. Well, I'll do something to prevent it. But when it happens, I would like to see anyone that goes in is ready for it. I would encourage young kids to learn how to live. You know, learn how to eat dry food, learn how to do this, learn how to track this, or learn how to find their way home, whether it's in the hills or in the city. You know, one of these days, that's part of growing up. And it's a not, it's not a violent way of growing up. It's just a survival way that everybody should learn how to do. But I think it's gonna be an eye-opening experience, just like that last movie that was put on in PTSD. We saw that and it was an eye opening for a lot of the civilian population that don't understand why he did what he did. And you see a lot of, a lot of vets, veterans that are going through that. I hope this uh, documentary uh, with veterans uh, helps other veterans. Um, uh, I hope that we can uh, show what the, the public what we are doing uh, after that 
After we, we come back out, that a lot of us need uh, some help or a lot of help because it's a very uh, strenuous job to be in the, into the combat zone and there's a lot of memory that goes back and it's hard to relieve that memory out of your, your body once you come back from the war. Like what the government is doing now, they're starting to help out more with veterans and um, I hope we get messages out to all, all of our veterans. Well, I always thought that I always wanted to know what war was like and now I know. I, I guess you just have to understand the reality of things what war is and what it's supposed to do. And I think the way that you get PTSD is if you, you are in a look in, you're in an area where you are constantly under pressure or under somebody's trying to kill you and you are under that stress for a long period of time, you eventually crack. We always had these uh, conversations in the jungle about what we were doing there and why. And uh, I was always saying that uh, we shouldn't really be here. Uh, this is a worthless war. And then I had uh, my, some of my best friends would say, oh, we're here to stop communism. We're here to protect America. And uh, I, I never believed that. It's, to me, it was just a war for rice. Suppose they, Vietnam was growing three quarters of the rice in, in the Asia. And we didn't want a communist party there in control. But it's a communist country still, and now we're good friends. Well, I know, I know that when we go to war, we're fighting for our country, and we got to do the best thing we can. And I felt that I was doing the right thing, you know, fighting the war and standing up for America. Now, after I came back, and I lived a few years here after the war, I started thinking about how many people died over there and so much destruction they were there. I figured, well, this war was really a waste, and it was. We lost a lot of aircrafts, a lot of people, a lot of equipment. So what did we gain? We didn't gain anything. We lost that war. Well, what they're gonna learn is to be prepared for themselves if they get, if they get to go to war, whatever war is gonna be in the future. They get to open their eyes and realize that we went through hell. I live a normal life now, like a normal person. And I'm happy. But it was rough growing up, it really was.